Hello, class. So uh, today we are starting on our movement, uh, start, starting on our unit uh, on uh, Young Poland uh, is the, uh, the artistic and literary movement that we come to after positivism. Um, so the Young Poland movement of Poland is really one of um, several young movements that happen around uh, Europe at this time, around the turn of the century, meaning uh, from 1899, you know, from 1890s to the early part of the 20th century. Um, in uh, more Francophone um, traditions, uh, it's called fin de siècle, uh, which basically just means end of the century, but uh, in English we often translate it as um, turn of the century. And when we say turn of the century, even today, we're talking about 19th to 20th century. Um, I don't know we, that we would, it's very rarely do you um, even, I mean, even now that we talk about from 99 to 2000 as being turn of the century, because it, from the 19th to the 20th, there was, there was so much upheaval, so many different things happening in world history that um, this is the real marker of, of, uh, of that period. Um, <clears throat> there were young movements, the, it, young moniker is mostly Central and Northern uh, Europe. Um, for example, there was Young Germany, um, the Young German movement. There was the Young Scandinavian movement. Um, one example of that is uh, Munch. I don't know if you know the artist Munch, uh, Edvard Munch. He was Swedish. Uh, he's the guy who did the you know the screen painting that you know is probably hanging up in a lot of your uh, dorm rooms. <laughs> well, if you're on campus. Um, but yeah, that poster is sold so many times uh, on uh, American college campuses, so um, it's hard to miss it. Um, so as positivism was a reaction to romanticism, young Poland, or more broadly these fin de siècle movements, uh, was a reaction against positivism. Um, in Poland, at least, the young Poland movement saw positivism as um, an acceptance of defeat, as just accepting the idea that Poland would never have its own liberty again, that would always be ruled by um, foreign powers. And so as the positivists begin getting older, the young people coming up, the young artists and, and authors, um, they are unhappy with their with the positivist philosophy of um, uh, the positivist program of not um, more stridently standing up against these, these imperial powers. Um, a lot of it is marked by a return to mystic, you know, the kind of mysticism and spiritualism of the romantics, uh, a return to thinking about the interior psychology of a, of a person. Um, it's the period all over Europe really is marked by um, real experimentation in art um, and literature. Um, and culture. Uh, uh, there, there's experimentation in every walk of life going on these, uh, um, I mean, the best way to describe a lot of it is just weird, just weird um, creations being done um, by artists and, and just citizens. I mean, in, you know, like, you know, new ideas about marriage crop up around this time, you know. Um, uh, you get, um, for example, Rimbaud, uh, I don't know if you know uh, Rimbaud, he was the French uh, poet who, you know, he was just kind of a scandal. Um, uh, he would, uh, you know, he, he was openly bisexual, he would ruin marriages, <laughs> have affairs with people, and he was kind of a scandal in France, but everyone loved him. He was a great poet, and he just kind of used his celebrity to do what, you know, to just you know, live this very hedonistic life. And you see this in a lot of, um, a lot of different um, uh, movements and artistic creations of the time. It was very suspicious, young Poland especially, was very suspicious of, it, uh, of enlightenment values that positivism had, had relied on. Um, it saw, it, it saw the, you know, the enlightenment as forgetting about the, um, 
I guess, you know, in quotation marks, spiritual life of a person. Um, it's uh, young, young Poland, but also the other young and fin de siècle movements um, are marked by an interest, an interest in breaking away from previous traditions, um, a, a return to the use of symbolism, um, Impressionism is a, is a, is a fin de siècle or, um, movement um, or school of art. Uh, art Nouveau, you may have heard Art Nouveau, right? Um, it's also the beginnings of surrealism. Um, you get a lot of um, more, uh, more surrealist artworks uh, being created around this time. Um, uh, so, uh, I'm going to go to a whiteboard. Um, so in Poland then, um, you get two strands of young Poland. And in the English speaking world, I think the best way to discuss these kind of new artistic movements and literary movements uh, is what we usually call it modernism. Modernism kind of begins around this time. It doesn't really take shape really until after World War I uh, as, as, a, as a school and program of, of literature and art. But um, it kind of has its beginnings around this time. Um, for example, T.S. Eliot is a quintessentially modernist poet. I'm sure you had to read some T.S. Eliot in high school. Um, he, he's, a, he's a bit later than these, but he kind of comes out of these these new experimentational traditions. Um, so there are two strands of the young Poland movement in, in this kind of modernism, and that's the decadence movement um, versus the neo romanticism movement. So Neo-romanticism just means new romanticism. So you get a lot of authors uh, uh, who go back to, um, you know, the very myst mystical Gothic styles of the romantics, right? They kind of rebirth that in a way. Um, uh, it's definitely a, a different than what had happened in um, romanticism, but it, it's, it's a, a it's neo. It's not romanticism. It's neo. It's new romanticism. It's, it's kind of taking their cue from from the romantics, but creating something different. Um, so, the decadence. So, what does decadence mean? So today, um, you'll often hear decadence meaning um, it used in terms of like, um, you know, like a chocolate cake is decadent, right? Um, basically, it means you know. These days, it has the definition of, of kind of like something being over the top as far as like luxurious goes, right? That it's um, that you if, if you do something decadent, it's uh, full of, you know, uh, hedonistic pleasure, I guess. Um, but really, decadence gets its, you know, we get the word decadence from decay. Um, and so what you see in this strain of modernisms and you know uh, decadent movements um, is the kind of realization of well maybe not realization but um, viewing current you know the contemporary society as in decay as in decline right um, you see these artists and philosophers Nietzsche comes out of this moment um, uh, and the, the decadents loved Nietzsche uh, they misread him mostly, but um, they still loved him. So they see uh, they have a very nihilistic view of the world. Um, they see current society as corrupt, as um, uh, you know, especially positivists as you know, creating a situation in which um, that, that didn't help society. That is actually leading to the decay of society. Now, the reason I say that most of these decadent myths read Nietzsche because Nietzsche does have a nihilistic view of society uh, or contemporary culture of the contemporary world. He's, he, you know, he writes about the 
uh, what he sees as you know as the decay of, of society going on around him, but he doesn't rejoice in it, right? He he's, he's depressed by well, he's yeah, he's depressed by what he sees. He doesn't. It's not like he sees you know he 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 calls for the decay of society. It's not like he he promotes uh, nihilism. He he actually is distressed by the nihilism he sees. Um, and this is where the misreading begins because then you get artists or authors who rejoice in the decay and they, you know, start doing these, you know, living these strange um, over the top lives full of excess, um, like Rimbaud in France. Um, so it's the decadent movement is very hedonistic um it uh, believes in ex excess except in everything anything pleasurable you, you start to get um a lot of um drug use around this time um it, it sees the death of god in society as as uh as nietzsche uh, saw um they 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 reject um universal values for a claim that there is such a thing as universal values and suggest that um, the individual can create their own values. Um, so uh, uh, the, an idea that, um, you know, values given to us from past tradition um, are um, contingent and have no true universal value. The, the individual uh, uh, individual makes, uh, I'm sorry, the value that an individual makes is uh, superior to that of past traditional values. Um, uh, the, the, the kind of catchphrase, one of the catchphrases is art for art's sake. Um, this is actually from a French, the kind of the French kind of created um, ah, ho, la. I think that I, so art for art is really all that means. Um, so art for art's sake. There's no reason, you know, the positivists um, promoted um, the idea that art should uh, have a lesson behind it, that there, it should be saying something about, you know, how to live or what, what the highest good for society is. The decadence uh, and really a lot of the um, just in general modernisms of Europe um, reject this and they say oh, there's no, art doesn't do anything. Art is just art and that's it's, that, that is a high enough value, right? It doesn't need to teach a lesson. Um, it stands on its own. Um, there, there, it doesn't have to do anything else but be art, right? Um, so the neo-romantics then, they have a couple different views. Um, they uh, maintain a realist style in their writing. Um, you'll see, so in, in Polish art anyway, you, you see Art Nouveau, um, I think that's as, or secessionist art as, um, as the neo-romantics uh, more preferred style. And, you know, Google it, you can find tons of um, examples of Art Nouveau. Uh, it's not as dark and weird and, and uh, nihilistic as decadent art, um, but it still is experimental. It, it doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't, um, need to represent reality as really as possible. So it, it is experimental, but it's not nearly as, as um, twisted as some decadent art can be. Um, um, and so that even though it, it, there's more realism in neo-romanticism, it still reflects, the, it still reflects the decay of society. It's, it's rather, it can be, uh, especially Polish, um, young Poland, um, it can be rather pessimistic. Um, uh, there's, there's a return to, uh, spiritualism, 
that we find in um, the Romantics, so neo romanticism, um, and uh, use of symbolism becomes important to the neo romantics. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, all right, so let's talk about uh, the authors we looked at for today. Um, I'm going to start. With you. So the first artist, the first author we looked at is, and let me change this Polish keyboard. Dan Stanisław, repeat after me, Stanisław Szybyszewski. Stanisław Szybyszewski. Um, that's a mouthful I know. Yeah. This weird um, yeah, it's very common in Polish. Yeah. Stanislav Przybyszewski. So um <laughs> there's a YouTube video that I saw one time about Przybyszewski by someone who definitely does not speak Polish. And um, but he had read like an English translation of some of Przybyszewski's works. So he wanted to do this uh art uh, this blog about it, I guess. Um, but he kept he kept saying his name is Stanislaw Przybyszewski or something like that. So it, 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 if you know Polish, it kind of grates on your ears. Um, so he lived eighteen sixty eight to nineteen twenty seven. So he witnesses uh, Polish independence in nineteen eighteen when World War One ends. Uh, he was very well known in Germany, actually. He wrote in German, like he, he wrote in German and Polish and also Swedish. Like sometimes he would write a book originally in Polish, sometimes originally in German, and sometimes originally in Swedish. He was a he was a polyglot. Um he was good friends with Edvard Munch, the, the Swedish artist. Um uh there's a, a famous portrait of Kibyshevsky done by Munch. Um he was known as the demon. Of Polish literature, so he, you know, he was kind of like what Rimbaud was to French society. Um, he lived a purposefully, pur purposefully, not purposefully, but on purpose, um, an excessive life. Um, he uh, was a um, infamous alcoholic and uh, drug user. Um, he he uh, divorced. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I, I misread my notes. He bro broke up lots of married couples by, you know, uh, by uh, having affairs with wives and probably husbands sometimes. Um, he uh, and he was unapologetic about the way he lived his life. Um, he's one of the, you know, as the decadence, he he reveled in the decay of society. And that's exactly why he misreads Nietzsche is because Nietzsche was not happy about the decay of society. Um, um, so the story we read for him is by the way. Um, and originally this is um, part one of a three part of three parts from a novel called um, Homo Sapiens. So this is a novel that he writes um, and this is just one of the chapters, really. Um, and it follows the life of Falk, the character Falk, um, as he deals with his excessive, ex excessive, excessive lifestyle, his sexuality, his sexuality, the deviancy he he foments, the the deviancy that he strives for in his life. Um, and it's funny, actually. Um, the English translation, it's difficult to find a, a like a physical copy of the English translation of this book. Um, because in 19, I think the year he died, maybe, or no, it was 1914. It was translated and published. It was published by Farrar, I think. I think Farrar published it. I could be wrong. But um it was almost immediately taken to court on um on uh, obscenity charges. Uh, a trial was begun uh, accusing it of, of being obscene. And instead of going to court to defend it, the, the publisher just stopped. They, they stopped publishing it. 
Um, and so the only like physical copies you can find, I found like one in a, in, in a library, um, but it was a uh, like a, not even a Xerox, but a mimeographed version of it. It had been like copied with those old <laughs> like rotating, you know, you had to like turn the crank um, and then just put into a hard cover. And that's the only copy I could find um, because they, they just didn't even want to fight the obscenity uh, uh, charges. Um, so it has a kind of weird history uh, in the English speaking world. Um, so it's, it, in my mind, the story really shows um, Kubitschewski's uh, devotion to Ni, make sure I spell this right, Nietzschean um, ideas but misreads them. Uh, just I, I, in my in my view, he he completely misreads Nietzsche, even though he you know he's devoted to Nietzschean ideas. Um, and another thing to keep in mind as you read this story, and I don't think it'll be difficult to find. And in class, when when I teach this with a, a live class, uh, I like to ask them if they thought it was a good story. And because the, like, the only good answer to that question is no, it's not written very well at all. Um, and but this is this is on purpose. Kubitschewski didn't care about narrative. Um, he's not trying to write a, a, a well thought out, well narrated story. He doesn't care about that. What he cares about is the psychology of his characters. Um, there is very little, like, you know, uh, narrative or literary description of anything. Um, there's just action, and that's what he wanted to do. That's he he does this on purpose. He he completely forget you know. He doesn't care at all about like giving a, a good middle, uh, beginning, middle, and end for the reader. That's not important to him. What's important to him is to explore the psychology of his characters and what their actions say about them and what how their actions create their identities. It's all he cares about, and that's what he puts across. So you'll definitely find that as you read this as you read this story. Um. So. The other author, what, what uh, the second author, I guess I should say, not the other author. Second author from the young poem that we read is um, sorry, give me a second. So the second author from this period that we read is what Wadiswav Raymond. So um, he lives 1867 to 1925. Um, and actually, the year before his death, his death in 1924, he wins the Nobel and uh, the Nobel Prize in Literature. Um, so I like comparing the I like I like setting these two authors up in comparison to each other because I think they're really good examples of the differences between the decadent and the neo-romantic movement. Um, he because he lives almost the exact same time as Kubitschewski, but their writing is starkly different. Um, uh, Kubitschewski actually does care about uh, beginnings, middles, and ends. He cares about narrative, right? He, t he cares about um, um, you know, making a work that readers can read and get something out of. Um, so he he, as the as a neo romantic, he uses the realism that the positivists had um, cultivated. Um, there's a nat he uses the naturalism that they that they um, that they promote and that they kind of create in in um, prose. But unlike the positivist, he's he's pessimistic. There's a um, there's a pessimism that runs throughout his, his stories. Um, so the stories that you re read from him um, uh, deal a lot with the peasantry in Poland. 
uh, a lot, uh, you know, th these stories are all, all about how the, the lives of peasants. Um, and this, this shows a really good, this is a really good way to, to, to uh, differentiate the romant the neo-romantics from the romantics. So for example, in Mitskevich, if you read Mitskevich, um, especially Pantadeusz, um, the romantics had this very idealized um, image of the peasants. Um, you know, um, they see the peasantry as the actual true core of Polish Polishness, right? Um, if you know, if you want to, if you want to really know what it means to be Polish, go out to the countryside and you know speak with the peasants. That's true Polishness for the Romantics, um, and you get this actually throughout Europe at the time, um, it, uh, the same time as Mickiewicz and, and the Romantics. For example, um, the Grimm brothers. Um, this is kind of the beginnings of, of nationalism, right? Like national identity. Before this, there, national identity was was really, if not if not vague, then almost completely um, un, un, unexistent. Um, in in the in the in the you know in the previous ages of of, uh, of feudalism or whatnot, it you know. The nobility of a, a, an area almost never spoke the same language as the peasants, and so national identity—it wasn't about national identity. It was about you know, you know, well, in Europe, being Christian, <laughs> what kind of Christian, um, and um, you know, who who your who who your allegiance was to, right? What king, what prince, what duke, etc. Um, it's only around this the time of the Romantics that Europe really begins to create these ideas of national identity. And so you get people like the Grimm brothers, and this also happens in, in uh, Poland, the, it happens all over Europe. Uh, but the Grimm brothers, they go out to the peasants to, to find what is truly German, right? That's where the, the fairy tales come from, the Grimm brothers tales. These are all uh, very old oral tradition stories that had never been written down until the Grimm brothers wrote them down. They go out to the peasantry, they listen to their stories and they write them down, and then the stories kind of die. You know, in the in, in the oral tradition, uh, as these tales are told between generations, they kind of they they always change a little bit. But once the Grimm brothers get a hold of them and write them down, they're you know they stop changing. You know, they, they don't they don't ever um, evolve with the current uh, society again. Um, so they kind of become these dead dead things now. But still, these are seen as you know the core of true Germanness. These tales because they come from the peasantry. Um, the irony is that if you look at Polish folklore, um, if you read a lot of Polish folklore and you know some stuff about the Grimm brothers, you know you read enough of this stuff and it's the same stories. Um, you know there, there's there's uh, Polish and French versions of the Hansel and Gretel stories. There's Polish and French versions of Cinderella. I mean. So what what they really found, but refused to recognize, was what they were finding was how how um, how common and intermingled uh, all these European nationalities were. That they all came, you know, they all come from a common root. Not that you know the German or is from like you know sprouted from this individual root somewhere, and that the Polish sprouted from some. It, it they they were all come from the same. The traditions eventually so uh but anyway uh back to um the difference then so mitskevich especially in pandadius when he writes about the peasants it's very optimistic they're they're the you know the um they're described in these you know they, they have a halo of of straw you know dust about them you know they they represent true polishness you know they they work the land they're connected to the land and so they're they are what is true about poland the neo-romantics come along, and Raymond especially, and you'll see this in his stories, and he also writes about the peasants, but he writes what he believes to be a much truer representation of the peasantry. He's not, he's, he's not um, painting them in, in, you know, these, um, in these uh, bright colors of, of uh, you know, of, of, a, of a quiet nobility. Um, he sees the, the filth that they have to live in. He sees the backwardness of their society because of uh, not being educated 
Um, he see, you know, he 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 writes and describes their daily lives in, you know, how they probably really lived. You know that uh, they're not the, you know, the golden ideal people that you know are one with nature. They, you know, struggle because they have to live in nature, right? Because they're because they're poor and they can't afford to build nicer houses with better plumbing. Um, and this is not something to be idealized for Raymond. So there's a lot of pessimism. They're not idealized the way that Mitskevich idealizes them. Uh, so this is something you'll get out of uh, the readings with him. Um, so I'm going to erase some of this so I can write about the other authors. Um, so the next author we look at is Gabriela Zapolska, and she lived 1857 to 1921. Um, so this, so Zapolska, I think, is a great example of an author's life being reflected in their art. Um, she, she was, um, very rebellious of, of contemporary Polish society. Um, he uh, re rebelled against the nicety, niceties of polite bourgeois society of the time. Um, someone kind of, someone said one time that she's almost a female version of Chibyshevsky, although her writing is much better than Chibyshevsky's in my opinion. Um, um, so, the she is also so she has a real pessimism as well um in her writing um i don't think you're supposed to find anyone as a hero in her work um all she sees when she looks at people are you know horrible beings people who uh have nothing but self-interest in mind um or weak people that you know. The, if, if in her stories, if a person is strong, they're terrible to other people. If the if a person is 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 a, a, a victim, it's their own doing. It's their own fault for being a victim. Um, so the stories we read read, read from her, um, Little Frog and Kitten, come from a larger collection called Human. Men, uh, men, men, menagerie, um, and it's a collection of animal titled stories. Um, all these, all the stories. So I don't know if you know what a menagerie is. A menagerie is um, basically a, a collection of animals, is, is what it is. So a zoo is a kind of menagerie. Um, so the human menagerie, then, um, all the stories in, in this bigger collection have animal titles. So, like little frog, kitten, and then there's others. Um, but these are all the names of characters or main characters of the stories. Um, and so she's using the animal monikers to, in, as a way to describe the, the people, which she, you know, there, there's some good reason why she's using the, these animal names uh, for people. Um, so the first one, Little Frog, um, I know it. In English, this sounds kind of weird to like Nick, you know, as for Little Frog to be a kind of um, um, uh, cute um, term of endearment. But in Polish, it would be, and again, I can't do the special Z. Let me get one. Sorry. Uh, in Polish, it would be. Oh, wrong one. Oh. There we go. And I'll just have to do a new thing. Um, so Little Frog would be um, Zapka. Um, so uh, and in Polish, this is actually pretty cute to, if you were to like, if you use the term of endearment, uh, is a term of endearment for someone. It's feminine. It's a feminine word. There's three genders in Polish. 
And so Jacques Ta would be feminine. So, you know, it's it's not out of the it's not out of the realm of possibilities that Japka could be used as a um um term of endearment for for a woman. Um and then the so um but we also have to ask ourselves why Japka? Um and I think one one possible explanation is if we look at the name she gives her husband. So um, she gives her husband the name um, uh, Crawfish. And the fact is that frogs eat crawfish, right? So she is a um, she's a predator compared to, you know, in, in terms of who, you know, her relationship to her husband. Uh, and so we see this dynamic at play in the story. Um, the second story, Kitten, is again, uh, that would be um, Kotechik, Kotechik. So um, the cult is a cat um, and cult is um, masculine gender. So this makes sense for the man in the uh, the main character. Well, I don't know who's the main character really, but the man of the story to be called Kotechek, right? And you'll hear, or even Kotek. Kotek would be um, would be a small cat. Kotechek is a really tiny cat. Um, so um, and you'll you know this is actually a really common thing for people to call each other. You know, for especially wives to call husbands. Kot you know that kind of thing. So Kotek. Um, but the, this is ironic because he's not a kitten, he's a tomcat. So I don't know if you, if I'm old, maybe I, and this is kind of an old word, but a tomcat, this is where Tom and Jerry come from. This is where Tom of Tom and Jerry, he's a tomcat. So a tomcat is a cat, is a male cat that roams, that isn't uh, kept at home. He's, 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 not feral, but he goes from home to home. He finds female cats all over the place, right? He's not tied down. And so we see this taking, you know, as exemplified in, in Kitten. Um, so uh, it, what I think is important to the Polska stories is to compare the psychopathy, psychopathy, or even Psychopathy, or even sociopathy. Socio, sociopathy. I think I'm saying these right. The psychop psychopathy, or even socio sociopathy of of some characters uh, compared to the passivity and even masochism of other characters. So um, if you were just to be told the, the bare bones of one of the stories, you know, for example, Kitten, you were just to be told that this is a story about a man who cheats on his wife, right? Instantly, the man is the villain uh, and the wife is the victim, right? But I don't think that Zapolska wants us to see see the characters in those terms. I, I think she hates the wife as much as she hates the husband. The husband is a, is a, is a villain uh, in the story, but the wife is a passive victim who doesn't do anything to, to better her situation. Um, and so I don't think, I think Zapolska has as much um, uh, uh, disgust for the wife as she does for the husband. So I think that that's a really interesting dynamic to to discuss in the in these two stories. Um, and I think this is also where Zapolska and Przybyszewski are kind of, uh, can can be compared um, in the way that they see the human condition. Um, uh, Przybyszewski sees the you know sees the the situation of the person creating their own individual values. Um, and that individual 
and be, you know, is right to be disdainful of other people. Zapolska sees the, you know, the current human condition of, you know, the relationships people have between each other. And all she sees are power dynamics and how some people have control and others don't. And those who don't have control, they're, they're their own worst enemies. They're to be blamed for why they don't have control. So um, I think those two authors are interesting to pair in those terms. All right, so here, fix this real quick and we'll talk about our final author from Young Poland. Um, so Stefan. Stefan, okay, so control, shift. Oh, I need alt now. Sorry, I don't know why this program will not let me make a special Z character, but it just won't. So Stefan, so alt, shift. Oh my goodness. Okay, try this one more time. Step on. I don't know what's going on. Sorry, guys. Oh, I'm hitting Z. Oh, I should be hitting V for, for paste. Uh, okay, I'm just going to move this here. Okay, Stefan. Uh, Shift, Alt, V. Alt, V. Control, V? Control, V. Oh, and it's not capitalized, but I don't care right now. <laughs> it's too long to do that. That should be a capital. Z. So, Stefan Jaromski uh, lived 1864 to 1925. Um, he was often called the conscience, conscience, conscience of Polish literature. Um, he was kind of held up as the, the, um, the ideal, you know, he writing about, you know, uh, the ideal of Polish society. Um, a lot of his works deal with social injustice. Um, he calls for compassion. Um, and he, a lot of his work is also uh, all about the need to resist the Russian Empire, Russian imperialism in Poland. Um, I guess I could put that all down. So uh, social injustice, uh, need for compassion, and uh, resistance against Russian imperialism. Um, a lot, uh, a lot of it, I believe he wrote the coming spring and I mentioned this in a previous lecture about, um, a, a Pole who had been deported with his parents as a young child to Kazakhstan. He has to make his way back to Poland after the death of his parents. And he ends up at the very end, he ends up leading a, um, a worker's revolt against, um, uh, I don't know if they ever mentioned that they're Russian, but they would probably be Russian or German um, owners of the, of, the, of the factories. Um, so one little thing to know about just the, this is really like a curious little thing to, to, to know from the story. Obzid Lovek is the name of the town that the doctor finds himself in. And this comes from all uh, Objed Live, I think I spelled it right, Objed Live, which just means ugly. So Objed Lovek, the name of the, of, the, of the town is just ugly place. That's what it, uh, but not just ugly, like disgustingly ugly. So um, you, get, you get the idea of what, you know, how the doctor sees this, this town um, or how we're supposed to see this town. Um, and again, it is very, um, um, it is also very uh, pessimistic, um, you know, especially, you know, at the beginning of the story, the doctor 
Um, he comes as a young doctor to this, to this little village and he just gives up eventually, right? After several years, he can't get anyone to change their ways. He tries to tell the peasants, you know, if you live, if you, if you do just these simple things, you'll be healthier, but the peasants rely more on traditional medicines and uh, traditional ideas about how to live. And he can't convince them to, you know, to, to live any differently. Um, and so he gives up. And then this, this event happens, right? Um, a young teacher in a neighboring village um, ends up getting um, typhoid. And it's because of her living conditions. It's because of the draft in the walls of, of the room she's living in with these peasants uh, in this town. But what really shakes him is the fact that he knows this woman. This is a woman from her, his past that he had been in love with, right? So this is like a past love of his and hadn't seen her in years. And the next time he sees her, she's dying and she dies with him trying to save her. Um, and, you know, if that's where the story ended, it would be a, you know, a darkly pessimistic story. But um, that's not exactly where the story ends. Um, I, for some reason, I clicked the video, I just realized. So uh, anyway, I hope you were able to see this bit. <laughs> So, um, but that's not where the story ends, right? There's a little bit after, right? The denouement uh, of the story, the, the, the falling action, the, the conclusion of the story. And it's, um, it's, it's a little funny, it's ironic, but he's able, he kind of takes, he, he, the, the death of this woman doesn't, doesn't just send him into a spiral of despair, right? It kind of recharges him to try to change the life of the region <laughs> and he takes heart in the fact that he's able to convince them to uh to stop smoking certain kinds of tobacco <laughs> right like at least he won that little battle right and so he's you know he finds a little bit of meaning in that enough meaning to continue his practice right so um i think it's supposed to be you know very dark um, very pessimistic, and then there's supposed to be a little glimmer of, of um, like a wink towards hope um, at the very end of the story. So um, that is that is um, all I have for Young Poland. Um, the next unit is going to be on interwar or interbellum or uh, independent Poland, it depends, you know, there, there's a lot of different ways to describe the period. Um, but uh, other than that, this is, um, I, uh, I hope you enjoy the stories and I hope you enjoy the little documentaries I also uh, gave you. So, um, bye-bye.